If you've been to a grocery store lately, you've probably noticed that all of America's food is ominously stamped with the day that food will die. I'm talking, of course, about expiration dates, which are also the premise of a 2011 movie with Justin Timberlake called In Time. Your time was stamped on your arm, and when your time was up, you expired. And if you're from Gen Z and you didn't realize Justin Timberlake was also an actor, he wasn't. But he didn't let that stop him from being in a ton of movies. When it comes to food, expiration dates might say expires on, or best buy, or use by, or even the magnificent for wholesome great taste served before date stamped below. But all of these expiration date labels have one very important thing in common. They have nothing to do with whether the food is actually expired. That's right, these so-called expiration dates on your food are not and have never been about whether your food is safe to eat. And this is not just my Andy Rooney get off my lawn opinion, it is the official position of the safety loving dorks at both the FDA and the USDA. The date you see on packaging is usually just some guy's best guess at when you're going to have the optimal taste experience, but the mere presence of a date on food packaging leads to 84% of consumers and 100% of grocery stores throwing away perfectly good food because a box told them to. And while listening to a charismatic box can sometimes be a perfectly fine choice, in this case, misleading expiration dates are a major contributing factor in the United States wasting 40% of our total food supply. Yeah, 40 with a D. Of all the food that gets grown or imported in the United States, we don't eat almost 40% of it. And the vast majority of that gets trucked to a landfill where it piles up, ferments, and turns into methane. And not to get too climate changey on you, but methane has a bad habit of f***ing off into the atmosphere where it lives the rest of its life as a greenhouse gas that traps heat 80 times more than carbon dioxide. And if that doesn't do anything for you, here's a stat. 2% of the US GDP goes to grow food that does not get eaten. Yeah. We're wasting the entire GDP of a country that goes here. Every year, the United States is growing and then wasting an entire Norway in food. Or an ironic three Hungaries. Sorry. And to be clear, it's not just expiration dates. Food waste is happening all over the place. The EPA is sufficiently freaked out by the emissions and toxic byproducts caused by food waste that they are watching the problem like an eagle. And organizations like Refed are cranking out charts and graphs that are exactly my style. Exhausting. God damn, green on green on green. Wow, I guess f you if you don't have perfect color vision. And the labels are way off to the side. At least make it 3D, people. Drop shadow is free. Let me just, okay, and there we go. And there we go. Perfect. Now, obviously, I cannot see this chart, but I am editing this video, so you'll be able to see that food waste is happening on every level of the food system. We lose 8 million tons of food per year because people get afraid of expiration date labels, but we also lose millions of tons to things like harvesting issues, mistakes and malfunctions, and food being considered too ugly. Food waste is a massively complicated problem, but the easiest and fastest thing to solve is people misinterpreting the labeling on their food. Plus, it's one that you can actually have a measurable impact on. Also, uh, I did a ton of research on food waste, and I gotta tell you, expiration dates were absolutely the funniest part, so that's why. Yuck. Hi, I'm Raleigh Williams. I have a belly full of milk, a head full of complaints, and a master's degree full of climate science and policy. And this is a video about how expiration dates are bullshit. Welcome to Climate Town. Despite what our collective great-grandparents may have told us, food in the 1880s and 90s was an absolute crapshoot. I mean, this woman was just served three identical plates of beans, so, you know, riddle me that, Chester A. Arthur. Now, I'm not saying my grandma Betty was lying when she talked about pies cooling on the windy sills, but without any real laws in place, food producers were playing things extremely fast and loose. 
friendo? Oh, your cheese isn't orange enough for you, hey? Why not sprinkle in a little healthy lead to give it a nice glow? Chocolate not shiny enough for your kids on their work break? Well, just gussy it up with a schmertz of arsenic. I do it every day. During the Civil War, they used formaldehyde to stop dead soldiers from turning into extras from The Walking Dead. This naturally led to a whole bunch of milkmen from the 1900s deciding to keep their milk from spoiling by adding a splash of the good stuff. And if the newspapers are to be believed, a tall glass of formaldehyde milk can really ruin a box social. Actually, you know what? Those people are so horned up, I don't think anything can stop them. Enter Dr. Harvey Wiley, the US Department of Agriculture's chief chemist who is consistently finding that when people ate things like arsenic and lead and formaldehyde, they got sick. Man, science was way easier to do back in the past. Actually, Harvey Wiley's story is crazy. He got together a group of young men who became known as the Poison Squad on account of how they all agreed to eat poison to see how poison affected them. All kinds of poison. We're talking borax, formaldehyde, acids, the works. Dr. Wiley's findings got national attention, and people were calling for food safety regulations, if for no other reason than to stop these dudes from poisoning themselves. That wasn't really gonna work for the food industry because, you know, they didn't want to be regulated in any way. There were some outliers. Henry Hines wanted regulations because he was worried that people might buy a bottle of ketchup only to find that it was packed to the gills with rat poison. Chicago style. However, the majority of the food industry lobbied their asses off and attempted to bribe or bully Congress into backing down. But credit where credit is due, Grandma Betty's generation didn't want to French kiss corporations quite as hard as we do today, so they passed the first food safety law in 1906. The name of that law? The Wiley Act. While the USDA and the FDA were busy passing food safety laws, America was urbanizing, and more and more people were moving to cities and suburbs and buying the bulk of their food at grocery stores. Food was getting packaged in one state, transported to another state, and then stocked on shelves, and food manufacturers began putting little codes on some of the groceries so stores could keep track of the stock. The codes were secret, and the practice was called closed dating. But like everyone who comes across a secret code, customers wanted to know what it said. Like this. It's a secret code. It says a secret. But I'll never tell. And I'm not saying customers are being unreasonable. You're paying a dollar for apples whether they've been on the shelf for an hour or a week. You'd rather get the newest ones. I get it. How would you, Mrs. Homemaker, go about finding out which one of these cans contained the best peaches or gave the most for your money? You would look in vain for some information on the labels that you could depend upon. The best possible guide that you, unaided, could have as to their quality. And by 1973, 10 states had adopted some kind of regulation to make stores de-secret their codes in a policy known as open dating. And no, I'm not gonna do a joke about open dating. I already feel bad enough about that Three Hungries shit from the intro. And as open dating became a trend and food manufacturers began openly stamping the date on the packaging, customers rejoiced at being able to get just the absolute newest eggs. But food experts weren't quite so jacked. In a 1979 study, a dream team of food experts from the USDA, the Department of Health, prominent universities, and more got together to express their nervousness that people would see the date and think it was about safety. On several occasions, they noted there is little or no benefit derived from open dating in terms of improved microbial safety. Which one of these cans contain the best peaches? The Government Accountability Office also warned federal lawmakers that failure to implement a national system would add to confusion if they let each manufacturer, retailer, or state choose its own dating system. So they tried to come up with a countrywide policy. Unfortunately, it's really fucking difficult to get all the representatives to agree on a labeling system that accurately conveys the concept of peak freshness for, like, all food. Couple that with the food industry viciously lobbying because, and I think I have this one right, they didn't want to be regulated in any way, and there was a failure to come up with a policy. 
From the 1970s onward, a sea of contradictory and nonsensical labeling rules bubbled up from every state. And over the course of just a few decades, a thing that started out as a bunch of 1970s era shoppers wanting the freshest bread became the expiration date nightmare we're currently living in. And that is the origin of 16 billion pounds of food being expired into the trash every year. Because a bunch of shoppers named Shirley and Lewis and Nancy wanted to know which box of crackers was newest. It's that stupid. It's actually even more stupid. Because manufacturers determine when a product expires, or is best buy, or has maximum freshness in two ways. The first way is they get a bunch of people in a room and they have them eat food of various ages and rate it out of 10. Once the average rating drops below a seven, that's the expiration date. It's not dangerous, it's perfectly edible, it's just not above a seven, so to Nabisco hell with you, you blueberry muffins. And that's the good way. The other way is that they just f***ing guess. Yeah, they don't have the money to cram a bunch of college kids onto a racquetball court and have them hork down taco shells till they get some sixes, so they guess. And in the case of a product that obviously doesn't expire, they guess for like a year or two from now, which is how you can get 250 million year old sea salt that expires next year. What are the chances? And this wouldn't even be that big of a problem if America didn't inexplicably read date labels like they were messages from future you trying to prevent your own assassination. And, and I'm just as guilty of this. Like last week, I was 95% sure I gave myself macaroni poisoning. Studies consistently find that 80 to 90% of consumers are throwing food out based on safety concerns based on a date label that has nothing to do with food safety. And our collective paranoia means that every year we're sending billions of pounds of food to the dump. And I'm not talking about the bathroom kind. Okay, cool it, there's only three of them. And this actually also counts, cause it's number two. And it's not just Ma and Pa Kettle at home. I honestly have no idea who Ma and Pa Kettle are and I refuse to look it up on principle. I just know you're allowed to say Ma and Pa Kettle when you wanna to refer to like normal people at home. Date label concerns are the number one reason why grocery stores and wholesalers have to get rid of perfectly edible food. Grocery stores know what date labels mean, but they're justifiably worried that their customers will fall in that 80 to 90% of people who think food past its date label is unsafe. We're just looking at the top few inches and it's eight feet deep, so we don't even know what's down there. Grocery stores cannot afford to lose customers. So if cereal is having a slow month and that new shipment of Lucky Charms comes in and needs shelf space, well, I hate to say it, but that little racist leprechaun is gonna finally get his wish of keeping kids away from his Lucky Charms because he's going straight to the dump. And it is way worse for fresh fruits and veggies. A new shipment comes in and the old stuff often gets tossed regardless of how perfectly edible it is. And if you're just visualizing us lighting a big pile of money on fire, it's actually worse than that. Because when we throw food in the trash, we waste all of this we use to grow the food to send it on a trip to the grocery store where we waste this to keep it there before we truck it to the landfill where it generates this. We're turning the environment into poison. We're basically doing a reverse Rumpelstiltskin. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, um, you know what, I'll put it on the Patreon page because it's gonna be tedious and I don't respect those people's free time. And wait, cause it's even worse than that. While expiration dates seem to have metastasized from something pretty innocuous, some states have weaponized expiration dates as a way to benefit special interest groups and certain industries. And there is no better example of this than the bare-ass hippie liberal socialist commune that is the state of Montana. This is Montana. The stock footage website I pay for has some beautiful clips of the Big Sky State. I have some cousins who live out there. I've visited a couple times. It's beautiful. And now we're back to New York. In Montana, it is illegal to sell milk that is more than 12 days old. 12 days. This is refrigerated, pasteurized, perfectly healthy and safe milk, but if the clock strikes midnight on the 13th day, it is illegal to sell that milk. 
The industry standard is 21 to 24 days, but Montana State Rule 32.8.202 forces Montana grocery stores under penalty of fine to remove milk on day 13. And if basic economics are to be believed, $1.60. Fine, I'll take it. Hold on a minute here. If that's the only stick you've got, I'll give $2 for it. Well, now wait a minute. I'll give you $3 for it. I'll give $5 for it and take it all myself. This creates an artificial demand for milk, which leads to higher milk prices in Montana and more money to the Montana dairy industry. State lawmakers have tried to change this law from time to time because grocery stores are constantly dumping milk down the drain, and you only really need to see a few clips of people being forced to waste their own money before you realize what a horrible law it is. But every time it comes up for debate, the Montana dairy industry lobbies against it, and the law magically stays on the books. Wow. Gotta love democracy. Milk producers from other states steer clear of Montana because by the time their milk gets pasteurized and shipped over to Bozeman, it's only got a few days on the shelves before it's no longer allowed to be sold. And for the record, I am all for subsidies for locally sourced foods. But when the subsidy is to get grocery stores to throw their perfectly edible food away, well, I mean, that just doesn't seem to be in line with the kind of free market economics traditionally espoused by the politicians of the great state of Montana. More taxes and regulations put Montana families out of work. The federal government is too big and too powerful. I'm Matt Rosendale, and this is how I'd look from a government drone. Wow, love the creativity. Quick note here, that's very much not what would happen if you shot your gun at a government drone. But at least this man is, um, currently a congressman. Spectacular. A lot of you are probably guessing that it's illegal to donate expired food. Or at the very least, you're liable to get sued if something goes wrong. I mean, that certainly seems to be a major concern of grocery stores across the country. It goes straight in the garbage. Yeah. So I do it because it gets too many lawsuits. There's too many lawsuits? Have you guys been sued before? I don't know tell you the truth, it's oh, not okay. my thing, but it's a health and safety issue, if it's close data, if it's like within two days, out the door goes. So yeah, the vegetable, same thing. Uh, sell by date itself, we pour down this, the drain. We, do, we cannot donate it to the food bank, uh, so we don't want anybody getting sick, supposedly. Except, here's the thing, you are completely covered by a pretty ironclad federal law called the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act, or BEGSFIDA for short. BEGSFIDA. It's a law that specifically protects people donating food in good faith, but apparently it's the nation's best kept secret. It is so important and so unknown that the 2018 Farm Bill explicitly asked the USDA to hire an employee who is personally responsible for making as many people aware of the Emerson Act as possible. And here we are five years in, and we're still losing 43 million pounds of food per day to people and grocery stores who are concerned about expiration dates. And not to put too fine a point on it, but there is no evidence of anyone in the United States ever being sued for a claim of sickness or death from donated food. Ever. It is so deeply not a thing that the Emerson Act has never once been used in a recorded case in the Westlaw database. So by all means, donate the food. What are you talking about? You must be crazy. Well, I'd never thought of it that way. But here's the thing. Most food waste is not backroom deals or corrupt politicians trying to steal your milk money. The catastrophic waste in the food system is largely a problem we've kind of sleepwalked our way into. Even if every grocery store and member of the extended Kettle family knew all about the Emerson Act and wanted to donate their perfectly good but technically expired food, we would still have an enormous problem. There are huge logistical challenges in moving food to food banks and keeping it from spoiling, but even if we were doing that, which we're not, we'd be using resources to transport food to another location where the problem starts again. That's treating the symptom and not the disease. However, an analysis from ReFed estimates that for every $1 we spend actually reducing waste along the chain, we get $6 back. And that's not to mention the jobs created, the emissions reduced, or the extra people fed. Speaking of people fed. Yeah, I Sick. Dude, BMW? I bet that dude is tight as hell. Speaking of people fed, there are about 50 million food insecure people in America, and we throw out about 130 billion meals worth of food a year. Which means we waste enough food to give every food insecure person seven meals a day. 
And if that's not a real kick in the balls to your system of ethics, which one are you using? Because uh, that sounds awesome. That sounds like an awesome one. So the USDA and the FDA could step in and just absolutely drop the hammer on the crisscrossing labyrinth that is different state date labeling regulations. They're just kind of not doing that. And look, I don't blame them. It's not as easy as saying no date labels on any packaging. Knowing when something was manufactured is actually important information to customers, and food producers and grocery stores want to protect their reputation by providing customers with accurate freshness information. The core problem with date labeling is that no matter what you display on the packaging, there's a perception that food becomes dangerous after a specified time. One solution may be as simple as all of us just encouraging each other to remember that date labels are not about getting poisoned. Food safety is incredibly important but the date label is just trying to help you determine which one of these cans contain the best peaches. So maybe just having a single label that tells you when the food was packaged would work. Or maybe a Best Buy label could do the job, but there's actually been some excellent thinking on different date labeling techniques, and we've linked to the good ones in the bio. And if you're interested in reducing food waste, there are actually quite a few options, including starting very small. There are a lot of problems that require rigorous political and social campaigns to even make a dent. But one thing you can personally do right now to make deep cuts in your own food waste is renew your vow to humanity's greatest weapon. I'm talking, of course, about your nose. You are the direct result of hundreds of your ancestors successfully using their noses to smell if food is bad or not. The people with bad noses, they're not around because they died. Use your nose. Smell the food. If it smells bad, don't eat it. If it smells fine, it's probably fine. Obviously, there are some foods you need to be more careful with, like the foods doctors warn pregnant women to avoid. Or foods that you eat cold without a kill step, as food experts call it. But if you're cooking food up and it's been refrigerated and cared for properly, you can almost always smell it and then eat it if it smells okay. We can also be smarter about buying food. Put fresh fruits and veggies in the front of the fridge instead of exiling them to the back of the drawer. You can also have a whole shelf in your fridge that is the eat this food first shelf. There's actually an incredible book by Dana Gunders we talked to while making this episode called Waste Free Kitchen. It pretty much goes through everything you're likely to eat and how to reduce food waste from it. It's not an ad, it's just a really good book. So uh, consider getting it if you feel like it. Reducing food waste on a larger scale requires one major thought. Food waste is not trash. I mean, think about it. We spend all this time and money concentrating energy and nutrients into food. It's more like a battery than it is an old hubcap. Now, the best way for you to reduce food waste is to buy less food and eat all the food you buy. But when you inevitably have waste left over, it's still an energy source outside of a landfill and a really dangerous methane producer inside a landfill. Keeping that energy concentrated is much more efficient than starting over from scratch, and some countries have made this shift by just banning food from going in the trash. In 1996, South Korea recycled barely 2.6% of their food waste, but after a 2013 composting policy, they are recycling nearly 100% of it. And it's not just other countries. A handful of states have also banned food waste from the landfill, including a law Vermont passed in 2012 that went into full effect in 2020. Policies like these only really grow with enthusiastic public support, which is another thing you can be a part of if you feel like it. If you have a composting program in your neighborhood or you have your own home garden, you can use the energy locked in your food to make more food. If there is no program in your area and you want there to be one, you can tell your local government to start one up. We got links in the description to help you do that. We've also linked a whole bunch of groups that are doing an excellent job on this problem, both on a national level or in a local level, and you can check out those links. But honestly, a few minutes on drgoogle.com will really help you put your money where your mouth is. Or um, your time where your eyes are, or ears. Yeah. As the food system starts to bump into the realities of a finite world, turning the one-way trip food currently takes into a loop is gonna become incredibly important. And the groups and companies that are making that loop a reality are gonna start cropping up all over the place. We are currently wasting billions of dollars a year because we don't want to spend money on a solution. And that is the kind of brain-dead plan only a very charismatic box can get behind. 
And that's it. Thank you so much for sticking with me. We got a little more after the break, but first, an ad. Imagine you're the kind of person that wants to invest in the stock market, but you don't want to hand your hard-earned cash over to a bunch of oil and gas companies. Should be easy, but it turns out that's surprisingly difficult to actually do. Enter Carbon Collective a neat little investment firm that offers a lower fee, diversified portfolio that won't directly fund the fossil fuel companies. How, you may ask? Well, step one. Oil, gas, coal companies, and all your little friends, you're out of here. Step two, put that money into companies that are uncausing climate change. Nice. Step three. Invest the rest in companies that could be climate friendly but haven't gotten their acts together yet and use shareholder power to try to push climate friendly resolutions. Now, is this the perfect solution? I don't know. But if you're looking to invest your money so you can eventually retire to the newly coastal city of Denver, I think Carbon Collective seems like a pretty good option to me. Plus, they're an implementation partner of Project Drawdown, which I like that. Or you can just do what I did, which is take out a ton of student loans and then cross your fingers. Carbon Collective. Ding! A little diamond on my tooth. Okay, that's the end of the ad. Thank you so much for watching Climate Town. Boy, do I appreciate it. Uh, if you wanna see more, feel free to like and subscribe or like send your friend a cryptic text message about Climate Town. You do, use your judgment, do what feels best. If you really want to support Climate Town, you can join our Patreon page, where for whatever you want per month, you get access to all the content we have on there that wasn't quite good enough to be free here on YouTube. Also, Climate Town just became a 1% for the Planet environmental partner. So if your company is a 1% for the Planet member and you want to support Climate Town, feel free to send us a message and as God is my witness, I will personally respond. I cannot stress this enough. We've also got a fucking newsletter coming out, baby. All right, sign up for that, link in the bio. That's gonna be all the extra little tidbits and spices that we couldn't cram into this episode. And I know what you're thinking, you cut stuff for this? This is long as hell. We did cut stuff, okay? Don't be rude. Yes, we cut a lot of stuff. And some of that fun stuff is gonna be in the newsletter. Guaranteed fun or your money back. And since it's free, don't get in my face about it. And finally, don't forget to write a third poop joke to pay off the setup from the beginning. Ah, shit. Well, I'd never thought of it that way. I have not tried marijuana. Uh, I have never used it at any time.